Yes, right? So, uh, great afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, and welcome to uh, Electoral Politics and the Left, Problems and Perspectives. So the American left and the black question, from politics to protest to the post-political. Um, I'll start off by reading the description of the panel, uh, and then I'm going to introduce uh, each of the four panelists um, in order, and then I'd like them to speak in that order. Uh, each panelist will have uh, 10 to 12 minutes for their opening remarks, um, and then following that, in the same order, they'll have uh, a few minutes to respond to each other. And then I'm going to open it up uh, to the floor for question and answer. Um, and we'll do one question at a time when we get to that. And uh, if you have a question for a particular panelist, um, please mention that in your question. Um, yeah, can you all hear me all right at this yeah. point? Yeah. Okay. So the panel description, let's get the right one this time, is... All right. Beneath the consensus of avowed anti-racism, the American left remains conflicted about whether and how to politicize race. This panel seeks to shed historical light on today's political impasses, asking, how has racism changed throughout U.S. history, and to what degree has racism been overcome in America? Our neoliberal and post-political present has been shaped by key periods of political conflict over race and racism. From the failure of the post-Civil War Reconstruction era, through the entrenchment of Jim Crow, through the abolition of legal racial segregation with the Civil Rights Movement. If we have overcome the forms of legalized racism that plagued American society before the 1960s, this victory has nevertheless failed to translate into the meaningful improvement of living conditions for the vast majority of black people in America. Instead, the general downturn since the early 1970s has been managed in a way that has worsened conditions for most black people in the context of broader stratification and brutalization of American society. This situation demands a strident refutation of the pseudo-problem of class versus race. We ask today's left to consider the implication of Adolph Reed's formulation that, quote, racism is a class issue, end quote. With a view to how a politics of freedom would approach race and racism, what lessons can be drawn from the most significant periods in the history of the American left, such as the populist movement, the pre-World War I Socialist Party, the 1920s to 30s Communist Party, and the 1960s to 70s New Left? If the problem of racism has been bypassed but not overcome, leaving in place the structural conditions that have shaped racism historically, how might we recognize the structural conditions and thereby render race and racism politically tractable. So, um, the bios, starting here to my immediate right, is Toby Chow. Uh, Toby has been involved in organizing in Chicago since 2009 as a leader in Seoul, a faith-based community organization on the south side and south suburbs. He is also the chair of the People's Lobby, an independent progressive political organization, and a member of the Center for Progressive Strategy and Research, a group within the People's Lobby that bridges the divide between radical analysis and mass political organization. Originally from Vancouver, Canada, he first came to Chicago in 2005 for the PhD program in philosophy at the University of Chicago, and is currently a um, Master's of Divinity yeah. student at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. Uh, next to him is Brandon Johnson, who is the deputy political director and also a organizer for CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, to his right is uh, August Nymphs, who is a professor in the political science department at the University of Minnesota in the Department of African American Studies and yes, political science, uh, specializing in, among other things, Marxism, uh, African politics, African American politics, and the transition to socialism. Uh, he has, I'm reading this off the website, but also he has numerous publications on those topics. And then finally, on the far right of me, is Adolf Reed. Um, I'm going to see if I can find his bio. <laughs> Where is it? Here it is. 
Adolph Reed Jr. is the professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the editor of Race, Politics, and Culture, Critical Essays on the Radicalism of the 1960s, and Without, Just and Without Justice for All, The New Liberalism and Our Retreat from Racial Equality, and is the author of The Jesse Jackson Phenomenon, The Crisis of Purpose in Afro-American Politics, W.E.B. Du Bois and American Political Thought, Fabianism and the Color Line, and numerous other publications. He served on the board of Public Citizen Incorporated and was a member of the Interim National Council of the Labor Party and the Executive Committee of the American Association of University Professors. So, welcome to our panelists, and let's start uh, 10 to 12 minutes uh, with each other. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Patipus for inviting me here. Um, like I said on at the plenary uh, panel last night, uh, the history of the left is not really my strong point, so I'm going to focus on the question of how to render the problem of race politically tractable. Um, so to start off, uh, from um, Adolf Reed and Barbara Fields and Erwin Chalkunyan, um, figures like this, I've taken a very important lesson to heart, which is that racial categories emerge out of and reinforce patterns of economic subordination. So we need an analysis of race and racism in terms of capitalist political economy. So, for example, Fields notes that uh, you know there's this common story about slavery, um, which she wants to debunk, right? Which is that first white Europeans and Americans saw black people, right? Then whites had racist ideas about black people, and because of that, whites felt free to enslave them, right? So first comes race, then comes racism, and then comes slavery. Um, and Field says, basically, this is mystification. She argues that, as a historical account, this gets things completely backwards. Um, the systematization of the enslavement of people of African descent led to anti-black racism and the category of a black race. So first came slavery, an economic relation. Then came racism. Then came race. So racism and the category of race emerged as part of the system of slavery. So from the outset, we need to understand race as a category of political economy. Now, um, the way in which racial categories have produced and reproduced themselves has changed over time. So one very obvious point is that uh, the stereotypical role of blacks in the American economy has changed radically. So at the time of the emergence of the category of a black race, uh, black slaves were a central labor force for, uh, responsible for creating so much of American wealth. And so not totally competent to trace the whole history from then till now, but it's clear that things today are very different. Today, the reproduction of race and the racism suffered by blacks has to do with the fact that blacks are disproportionately superfluous as a labor force. Right? So black labor is no longer at the center of the American economy. Rather, it uh, has been disproportionately marginalized. Um, so the, the contemporary category of a black race and the racism faced by blacks today can't be understood independently of this fact. Um, now here, again, a lot of well-meaning people um, who care about racial justice are going to be inclined to tell a story parallel to the one that Fields rejects in the case of slavery, right? So first they would posit race as an independent fact about the world. Uh, then they would posit racism. Um, particularly among white people who control the economy, I guess. Um, then uh, they would see economic exclusion as a result of racism. And once again, I think today this is mystification. Uh, today, um, I would see our ideas about black people as part of how we as a society understand and manage a labor force uh, in this neoliberal free market economy in which blacks are disproportionately superfluous to that labor force. So race remains a category of political economy. Um, so, you know, um, disclaimer, this is, not, I'm not, uh, this is not an attempt to uh, reduce race to class, so I hope I don't get hurt that way. Um, and I'm also not talking about um, understanding the intersection between race and class. Rather, I would say that race can't be understood independently of class uh, and vice versa. So there is an internal relation between categories of race and class. So, um, you know, in order to deal with the black question or the problem of race in general, um, I think it's clear that we need to deal with uh, the capitalist political economy. Now, uh, people on the left who come to this realization um, are often tempted to say, uh, and I've heard this, that in order to deal with race, 
And racism, we need socialist revolution, right? Capitalism created race and racism. Capitalism sustains race and racism. So we need to abolish capitalism in order to abolish racism. Um, and I think that would be great. However, uh, I want to push back on that um, strategy. <coughs> so, like I said at the plenary last night, I think we need to carefully distinguish between the task of overcoming neoliberalism, which is the current phase of capitalism, and the task of overcoming capitalism itself. And I think that we on the left currently face the task of resolving the crisis of neoliberalism in overcoming neoliberalism. However, I do not think that there is currently any chance that uh, we will overcome capitalism in that process. In other words, I think we face the task of bringing about a post-neoliberal society, and I think if we do this right, then it will be a much more egalitarian global society with a more inclusive economy, both in the US and across the world, but it will still be a capitalist society. Even so, I think that in the right kind of post-neoliberal but still capitalist society, a more egalitarian and inclusive political economy could allow us to make a great deal of progress uh, with respect to the problem of race and maybe, maybe even allow for the withering away of race as a social category entirely. Um, so um, I think our task is to overcome neoliberalism. Uh, first of all, this is necessary because it's in crisis. But in the context of this panel, we also need to overcome neoliberalism because it has proven to be impossible to deal properly with the question of race under neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, despite its embrace of the ideals of diversity and multiculturalism and anti-racism, has perpetuated racial inequality and in some ways even deepened it. And how has this happened? Well, uh, one way to look at it is through a helpful distinction um, made by Nancy Fraser between personal and impersonal forms of subordination. And she applies this uh, to the question of gender, but I think it also applies to other um, categories of descriptive identity. So personal forms of subordination are more obvious and familiar to most people. These are prejudice, bigotry, <coughs> chauvinism, and so on. Uh, these are the targets of uh, neoliberal identity politics. Um, and in general, neoliberalism has allowed for significant, if still limited, progress against many forms of subordination stemming from uh, personal prejudice and so on. At the same time, however, neoliberalism has intensified impersonal forms of subordination which operate through market forces. And these forces have disproportionately negative impacts on women and minorities of all kinds in markets of all kinds, the labor market, the housing market, and so on. Um, one example of how this plays out, uh, during the decade of the 60s, uh, the black poverty rate in America was cut from about 55% to close to 30%, and this was in a time when America was full of racists. Um, under neoliberalism, though, when ideals of diversity and anti-racism are mainstream and um, totally accepted by all neoliberal elites, it has, uh, the black poverty rate has hardly budged, and in fact it's increased since the turn of the century. And this is a result um, not of, um, we can't even analyze this as the result of like racist bosses everywhere. Um, it is the result of the unforgiving pressures of the abstract forces of the race to the bottom neoliberal labor market. So um, I, I think that the struggle to overcome neoliberalism is also the struggle for a more economically egalitarian and inclusive society in which these impersonal forms of subordination can be confronted and rendered less vicious. And I think that will also create the conditions under which we can make some real progress on the problem of race. And uh, I want to finish up with uh, a few comments about how I think about this in the context of organizing. Um, so, um, you know, most people in this room are probably very critically, very critical about identity politics, and rightly so, but from an organizing perspective, I think uh, I feel the need to recognize that many people of goodwill who want to get involved in a movement to make the world a better place get especially excited about the idea of doing something about inequality according to race and other identity categories. So I think it's important to figure out how to link issues of economic inequality um, and how this has been exacerbated under neoliberalism to the concerns that people have around the subordination of identity groups. And I think this can be done. Right, so just from my experience at Seoul, which is based in the majority black south side and south suburbs of Chicago, 
uh, you know, we've, we've worked to connect the dots between concerns about racial inequality and the structure of the economy. In some cases, this is easy. Some of the social ills that are stereotypically associated with urban black communities, such as unemployment, are obviously economic issues. Uh, but uh, also when it comes to other issues, such as gun violence, uh, police violence, mass incarceration, it is not actually so hard to show that these issues have a class dimension and to show uh, how this necessitates involvement in a kind of left economic populism um, that can contribute to overcoming neoliberalism. And, you know, on Wednesday there's a big Fight for 15 mobilization uh, coming up and we're involved with that at Seoul and, um, you know, I'm happy to see that a lot of the talking points around that uh, say actually explicitly that racial justice is economic justice and vice versa. Um, noting that 46% of Chicago's black workers are in low-wage jobs. I think this was from uh, BYP 100, the Black Youth Project. Um, and noting how um, low-wage workers exacerbates problems of gun violence in urban neighborhoods. <clears throat> so, I mean, perhaps the people connecting these dots in this way haven't, they don't have, maybe they don't have the most sophisticated analysis of race, but for the purposes of rendering race politically tractable, uh, I think this is something that we can work with. And we don't have to let anger over racial injustice get captured by neoliberal anti-racist agendas. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Toby, for that uh, uh, great introduction. I think to, to I think a very um, necessary conversation, and uh, it's always good to have a good leadoff man. Um, as I prepare for yet another long season of the Chicago Cubs, uh, I do think that our leadoff man this year is pretty good, even though I don't know his name yet. Uh, but but this is um, a, a very important conversation, and and, and I'm going to uh, try my best to to give it, you know, some uh, some merit to this conversation from you know a very simple perspective, right? So I won't attempt to, and thank God I don't have to, uh, because our third hitter, and certainly our cleanup hitter, um, if he's anything like Andre Dawson, that shows you how long I've been waiting on a winning team, uh, it should be okay. Um, so you know, I'm just going to try to move the runners up. Um, but I think one of the things that, that strikes me about those of us who identify as left, and I'm going to say those who identify as left, because we all know um, uh, in this room, uh, we're all oftentimes judged more critically by our own sisters and brothers on the left who say you're not left enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there is some uh, room to, to, to determine ultimately what is left. And so what I'm going to attempt to do is to give a very straightforward, simple perspective from how black folks just relate to not just the left, um, but the economic conditions in which we uh, reside in. Um, and then talk a little bit about um, some opportunities that we had during this last season and opportunities that we do have moving forward. Um, as someone who has worked uh, to organize working class folks um, and poor people, um, it's a very unique position to be in um, because one of the challenges that I do believe that we do have for those of us uh, who see the world in a more just, equitable way um, is relating with the folks that we believe we need to spark or to improve their lives. And that, that relationship sometimes is difficult because we come from, in many cases, different perspectives. And so I'll talk as someone who is a, a working class black man teaching poor children. And as someone who grew up low income, not poor. It's a difference. Low income, we, we ate every day, we didn't like what we ate. Poor people, <laughs> right, that's, that's low income. Uh, poor folks uh, are guessing day to day what they're going to eat. And coming from a perspective of a working class family, that there are certain conditions that even if I attempt to understand, I cannot relate with. And oftentimes, in the midst of our work to organize these communities, we see the conditions, we assume the folks who are living within these conditions only see a certain way out. And that way out is ours, because we have all the answers. If we can just put it in to 
of the destructive practices of capitalism, then black people will give us us free, right? But the harsh reality is that there oftentimes exists not just this disconnect, and I'll better explain that, but there's this trepidation of the ideas that are being promoted because black folks don't always get down <laughs> with um, ideas or ideals that do not automatically relate to their immediate space. They don't, or we don't. And when I taught in the classroom, coming up in a working class family but trying to relate with students who are poor, there's just certain things that I just did not see. And I can say to a student, it's important that you study and that you work hard and that you come to school prepared because if you just begin to do those things, then the, the, the experience and the existence that you're in right now will, um, will be eradicated. And when you're hungry and homeless, coming to school prepared to discuss the four causes of the American Revolution, and that's going to relate to my economic come up, Traquan is not making that connection. Does that make sense? And so when I'm having a conversation with even uh, Traquan's mother about why it's important to come to school, come to school prepared, because this preparation is ultimately going to help galvanize our larger race so that we can improve our economic conditions, I'm also trying to convince this mother through a system that uses a measuring tool that's inherently racist. So in the midst of us trying to make these connections ultimately to, prove, to improve the lives of, of, of black America in particular, there are these disconnects as well as these harsh um, economic realities along with a system that only thrives when it convinces black folks if they only do this, life will get better. So whether it's convincing black America to, to buy into the open market, your life will get better. Convincing black America if you only just study harder, your life will get better. That do understand when black folks reject left principles, it's not because they just don't like uh, 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 the, the left ideology, it's that we've been presented with opportunities to come up before. We're time in, time, time, in, over and over again, there are these promises or these hopes that are presented to a community that if only these ideas and principles are embraced, then your lives will get better. And as Toby obviously has already indicated, uh, that the unemployment rate uh, <coughs> In Chicago, particularly black America, black Chicago, um, looks like the Great Depression. That poverty in black Chicago, um, uh, if you drive down Laverne, if you make the wrong turn coming on the west side of Chicago, um, that you would forget that you were in one of the most wealthiest places in the country, if not the world. Um, and so this disconnect is something that I think is an important note. Um, the left in the black community is heard, but not seen. I'm going to say that again, so those of you who might want to tweet it. Um, the left is heard and not seen. So what am I saying about that? It's not that black folks are not, like, we're aware of the economic state that we're in. We're very aware. We're very conscious of it. And I actually have some great ideas of how to improve that. But what often happens is you have these moments where there's a little bit of a spark. And then that energy ostensibly is supposed to be used to catapult us into this sustained movement. And it doesn't happen primarily long term because the left tends to disappear. We're good at book studies. We're good at having social groups. We're, we're good when it comes to um, synthesizing and analyzing the conditions that exist within 
black America. But what the left, what we're not good at, is being able to have a conversation at a door with a mother who certainly needs to know that two-thirds of corporations are not paying their fair share in this state. She needs to know that. She also needs to know that there are millions of dollars, of course, that are sitting in a, in a, in a slush fund that are our tax dollars that could be used to reinvest in our community. She needs to know that. But oftentimes, there's an immediate need that those of us on the left sometimes do not have the patience to be seen in a community long enough to address some of those immediate needs. And if we're going to have a real honest conversation about the type of transformation that black America has to experience, that those of us who understand that, those of us that need to help make that argument, also have to understand that there are some real immediate needs that oftentimes don't appear to be um, available to be reached through some long-term strategy. And so what do I mean by that? Think of this immediate cycle where we had an opportunity to shift the dynamics here in Chicago politically. Many of us saw the aldermanic races and the mayoral race as an opportunity to extend a conversation, to think about long-term uh, coalition building and long-term transformation, while at the same time dealing with some very specific needs that folks in the community have. And there's a, a, a sister on the west side of Chicago. Her name is Tara Stamp. She decided to run for alderman. And Tara Stamps, by, by all accounts, particularly in this climate especially, um, and certainly that was someone that is far more progressive, that has you know, left principles. She comes out of legacy in this city um, where her mother fought tirelessly to, um, to make sure that housing was available, um, um, in affordable housing in particular, for housing for low-income families available. So she comes out of the vein of progressive, more left, radical belief systems. And one of the challenges as we experience moving and working in this electoral setting with someone who has like, incredible progressive, as folks would call, or left-leaning principles um, to, to, to address the economic uh, uh, climate um, in a real substantive way, when we would knock on doors, talking to families about how we can have a better 37th Ward, a better West Side, a better Chicago, we also had to have conversations about what it means to come home at night and not feel safe because there are young brothers on the corner hanging out. Now, again, we can talk about the economic strain that's on a community, uh, the criminal industrial complex that puts strain on community that often leads to the brother or the sister hanging out on the corner. But in the immediate need, those residents at the doors were not necessarily eager to have a conversation about sort of that big picture phenomenon that has to be addressed. What that conversation had to entail was not just simply about the criminal justice system, the economic plight, but even the family conditions that, that often lead to poor choices. Like those are the type of conversations that those of us on the left have to not only be sensitive to, but willing to spend time having those conversations so that you ultimately can move a conversation in a more substantive way about how we actually alleviate and pull, um, or eliminate the, the, the type of what, what residents would call as riffraff on the block. I think the other thing that struck me during this season as we look at black America and how the left relates to, to the conditions of black America, that, the, that there are three components that I believe that have to be addressed. And not just what was just discussed um, in terms of the, the criminalization that, that oftentimes uh, gets ignored in this conversation, but the, the issue of black labor is paramount in this discussion. Um, something that I that I struggle with as 
as a worker. That in, in order for us to actually have like, real conversations about not just simply conversations, I'm sorry, and being heard and not seen, the, the, the challenge of, of black labor is, I think, far more harsh and dramatic than I think those of us on the left appreciate. That's my analysis. Um, if you look at what has happened, not just here in Chicago, but across the country as it relates to black workers, it's not a surprise that as black labor continues to be under attack, that the conditions within our communities continue to, to worsen. Um, black educators in Chicago have been decimated. We've lost half of our black teachers um, within the last 10 years. Um, I think what's also striking about black labor, I mean, even the, 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 the situation in, in Atlanta, um, how you had these black workers who were who were essentially responding to um, the, a, a policy that, in my estimation, forced um, black workers and black children in, 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 in a circumstance that there's just there's no winning in that, and how black workers have not just been attacked as it relates to policy, but even in how um, education policy is carried out and even the criminalization that happens as a result of education policy, that the left has to have not just real conversations, but really promote and push substantive policies that actually deal with um, the, the harsh conditions that black workers are experiencing right now. And it's, it's a phenomenon that has run amok under this current structure. Um, the, the, the second thing is of black labor, and I have to run through this quickly, the second thing that, um, that has to be addressed when it comes to how the, black, how the left deals with, with black America is how do we make sure that those who are most impacted by these harsh policies are actively engaged and how the organizing has to be carried out. Too often what I see is well-to-do, well-meaning white folks that want to connect and want to relate with these communities, but do not do enough to actually empower these communities to take ownership over their own conditions and circumstances. I don't see enough of that happening. I think the third thing, besides black la labor, as well as um, black labor, as well as um, like really empowering those to, that are ultimately impacted by these gross conditions. I think the, the final thing is this. The, the, there's a certain element of, um, of uh, elements within our community that, that challenges our existence because, because of the way class is promoted um, um, in America. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to me to watch, and this is, I think this is a challenge I think that all of us have, is that when it comes to poor people, middle class blacks, or what we would consider like working class blacks, that how we relate, even within the class of, of black America, is something that we have to have a deeper and a better appreciation for. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes, and I'll close with this, sometimes when it comes to like how the left relates to blacks, that we, the left gets uncomfortable with um, departmentalizing class within the black struggle. And all of us still have it, whether you're middle class, working class, or poor, these different struggles, and, and what that looks like in, in real term is if all my life I was raised low income and my father has to convey a message to me that you need to do better, you can do better, don't be like the rest of those folks out there, work hard, separate yourself, 
you can do anything you want to do, that we've had this conversation in America for far too long where you subconsciously begin to look at people as less than simply because of how the message was conveyed to you. So if you see a brother or a sister hanging out on the corner, if you've heard all your life, be better, do better, you can achieve, when someone is not adhering to that standard, then we assume that they did not want to do better, be better, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I think that this conversation about how the black left moves forward certainly has to move forward when it, around black labor, how we build black political independent power, and how we relate to black folks within uh, the different class systems. Thank you. Yeah, I, I too want to uh, thank uh, Platypus uh, for inviting me, especially to link up with uh, my comrade here. He and I go back uh, a long time. Uh, we have roots in New Orleans with all of the lessons uh, around race, class, and color uh, that come with that uh, uh, experience. I'm in com complete agreement with the, his formulation that, the, that racism is a class is a class issue. And I think uh, Barbara Fields, we're all obligated to the work, pioneering work that uh, Barbara Fields uh, did um, more than a couple of dec decades ago that was referred to uh, earlier. Racial slavery is a product of uh, indentured servitude. You can't, that's where racial slavery comes out. It's a, it's a class, if ever there were a class institution, it's indentured, indentured servitude. That's where racial slavery uh, uh, comes from. Uh, the history of the United States uh, makes it very clear the links between the why racism is a class question. And I think maybe one of the most instructive moments is uh, Reconstruction and the uh, overthrow of Reconstruction. There's a formulation in the, uh, um, in the description of the panel that says, that it refers to the failure of the post-Civil War Reconstruction. Uh, I, I want to obj object a little bit to that. Uh, uh, formulation of failure of the post-Civil War Reconstruction. Post-Civil War Reconstruction was overthrown. It didn't fail. It, it was overthrown. It was a bloody counter-revolution. It was a bloody counter-revolution. That's, yeah. Because when you use the term failure, there's sometimes the connotation that this was a failed experiment in democracy and so on. So we have to be, be very clear. And it was a counter-revolution exactly because what we saw beginning to happen where labor and white skin and labor and black skin began to come together. And the ruling class was very fearful of that. And therein is, is a very, very important lesson for all of us today. Go back and study what actually happened during, during re, 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 Reconstruction because therein, I think, are uh, lessons for understanding what we have to do today. Let me say a little bit about the current, uh, the current situation. Uh, I think, as everybody knows, we're in an unprecedented uh, uh, crisis. This is a crisis of capitalism of historic uh, proportions. No one in this room has seen anything like this uh, before. And uh, even mainstream bourgeois economists, uh, uh, some of them at least, refer to what we in as uh, secular st uh, stagnation. That is just going to be around for a very, very uh, long, long time. And it takes its toll on the working class in all kinds of ways. And, and in labor, and the working class, and in, in brown and black skin and so on, are, are really taking it on, on the chin. <coughs> the data at the depths of the crisis, uh, the data on uh, household median uh, wealth, uh, I think was very stark and very sobering. Uh, the uh, black median household income um, on the eve of the crisis was around about $6,000. It's down, it's less than $5,000, median, median household wealth. Uh, white median household wealth is around about $100,000. 19 times, 19 times that of uh, black uh, median household uh, uh, in, income. This is what we this is what this, it will take, in other words, it will take a socialist revolution to overcome the inequalities within uh, U.S. society, 
uh, the differences between labor and white skin, labor and brown skin, labor and white skin, uh, black skin. Uh, in a few months, the Federal Reserve Board will, will increase short-term uh, uh, interest rates. We don't know exactly when that's going to happen. But this will effectively lock in the unemployment rates. Lifting short-term interest rates will effectively lock in unemployment unemployment rates, which means it will get worse. It will get worse. Uh, of course, we should never forget this is an institution that no one in this room has the right to vote on its decisions, to vote on its members, and to vote on its Gets to the very, I like that example, is if, if that fundamental incompatibility between democracy and capitalism. The Fed, the way the Fed operates, it's the fundamental incompatibility between democracy and, and capitalism. All right, so that's, uh, that's the crisis, and the question is how do we get out of it, and what are, we, what, are we, what, are we, uh, what are the solutions? And so I've already indicated that, in my opinion, only, only with the overthrow of capitalism is it possible to overcome this crisis in a way that will actually be in the interest of working, of working people. I spent all day yesterday at a conference on the uh, Voting Rights Act. This is the 50th anniversary uh, of the Voting Rights Act. It was signed in uh, August of 1965. Uh, uh, and um, it's under attack. Uh, there are efforts on the part of various states as, as a result of a Supreme Court decision uh, to begin rolling back uh, sections of the, of, the voting, of the Voting Rights Act. And it deserves to be resisted and to be fought for, that is, to defend the Voting Rights Act, but in a way that I think is probably different than the way many liberals certainly defend the Voting Rights Act. And I want to see if I can make a, a case for looking at the electoral process from a revolutionary perspective. I think the biggest obstacle, the biggest challenge that uh, workers in black skin faces the same challenge that workers in white skin and brown skin face. And what I call the stranglehold of bourgeois lesser evilism. The stranglehold of bourgeois lesser evilism. And that is the, the, the belief uh, that we can resolve this crisis through the electoral process. The belief that this crisis can be resolved through the electoral uh, process. Um, I want to go back to the traditions of Marx, Engels, and Lenin. This is the work I've been doing for the last five years in writing about, looking at what they left us, the lessons and so on, how to make revolutionary usage of the electoral and the parliamentary uh, arenas. To, uh, to think that the electoral and parliamentary arenas are an end in themselves, that is a a means to overcoming this crisis and so on is what is to be afflicted as Engels once and Marx and Engels once said and led into parliamentary cretinism, and that is the assumption that the elect that the parliamentary arena is the end all and the be all of politics. And what Marx, Engels, and Lenin argue for is real politics takes place outside. It takes outside. It takes place outside the electoral and parliamentary arenas, in the streets, and on the barricades. That's where real changes always come from. I know of no example in history where fundamental changes come about through the electoral parliamentary arena. I think the most consequential election ever in the history of the United States was the Lincoln's re-election in 1864. And that was decided on the barricades. Sherman. Sherman's march to the sea. That's what made it possible for Lincoln to be re-elected. I, I, I've supplemented, I've tried to supplement parliamentary cretinism uh, with another concept, something I've uh, coined, I think it's original, I've never seen anyone refer to it, uh, uh, voting fetishism. Voting fetishism. And by voting fetishism, I mean the, it's the mistaken belief that when you vote for either a policy or you vote for a candidate, that you're somehow exercising power. Voting fetishism, again, is the mistaken belief that when you're voting for an individual or 
or you're voting for a referendum, a particular policy and a referendum initiative, that somehow you're exercising power. Uh, that, that's a mistake. Uh, that's, uh, that's, and, and it can be very costly and sometimes deadly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, voting, when you vote, you're registering a preference. You're registering a preference. To be more specific, you're exercising a right to register a preference. <coughs> you're, not, you're not exercising power. Power is something that has to be taken. This is what the Cuban Revolution taught us. <laughs> power has to be taken. When you vote, you're registering a preference. And we shouldn't confuse the two. Difference, a world of a difference. Think about what's involved in a vote. <laughs> when you vote, it's a very private affair. And it doesn't take very long. No two things that could be as foreign to the process of taking power. <laughs> taking power is a very public affair. And as the protesters in Tahrir Square have learned, it can be very long and drawn out. <laughs> So we should never confuse the two. The, uh, the two. For Marx, Engels, and Lenin, you use the electoral arena, the parliamentary arena, as a means to an end, to figure out when are the best chances for taking power, how to count your forces. Use it as a way to get out revolutionary ideas, count your forces, determine the day when the moment is right to actually take power. That's, that's the... That's the <clears throat> program that Lenin uh, called revolutionary parliamentarism. And I want to make a case for it as an alternative to what I call the stranglehold of bourgeois, bourgeois lesser evilism. And I'll let, I'll let, we'll end on that and let that serve as a basis for discussion. Thanks. Well, I'm going to begin by saying one of the most deadly things an academic ever say, which is I'm going to try to be brief. Um, <laughs> and and uh, also, um, um, I want to thank August for, uh, or join August in thanking Platypus for um, the invitation. Uh, it's a you know, good discussion, good uh, group uh, among whom to have this discussion. Uh, and personally, it just gives me the occasion to see old friends and comrades and, and you know, home folks like August and, and uh, to meet. Brandon and Jason live uh, um, after talking a lot. See uh, the, the other old comrades around, um, and uh, you know, I mean, just for a, you know, a quick trip down memory lane. Like you recall, the impartial administration of justice is the foundation of liberty. That, that's the bullshit that's emblazoned up. Oh, well, that's in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was burned, yeah. burned into my brain yeah. by age fourteen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to spit at it every time I wrote, um, I, yeah, I wrote past it on the bus. But anyway, um, um, I guess I should apologize also because I, I'm, uh, I think that my comments are going to be more disjointed than they normally are. I mean, and uh, you know, schematic. Um, I thought for a minute you know, I could be aphoristic, but I think even that has begun uh, you know, to melt away. But what I will do is at least to give um, a simulacrum of an impression of um, coherence is to start out with a couple of, or with a handful of aphorisms, right? Um, for instance, uh, um, but, uh, but Barbara Fields would be quite quite happy um, to know that, that, that she, she's, she's being invoked in the way she is. I'm going to keep it rolling. Because um, Fields has also said that race is a language through which American class contradictions or class contradictions of American capitalism are often expressed. And that's a nice, pithy way to think about this. She also has said more recently that the way many people, and she said especially in cultural studies and in English departments some of these days, talk about slavery, you'd think its purpose was the production of white supremacy, not, not cotton. <laughs> um, all right, so that's Fields. Um, uh, also, um, I got a few more actually. Um, in uh, the dusk of dawn, and I think that these have to do with how we think about race, or or how it's helpful to think about what race is. And now I'll come back to why. Um, in uh, Du Bois's second biography, more or less, uh, you know, Dusk of Dawn, published in 1940, 
that there's a chapter where he has an um, apocryphal conversation with an apocryphal visitor from a foreign land who's trying to understand what race is in America. And they go through, and it's a Socratic kind of thing, and, and, and they go through all the technical specifications that, that uh, support uh, racial classification. He dismantles every one of them. Finally, um, uh, he uh, tells the um, uh, unbelievably frustrated foreigner that, well, uh, a black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in, in Georgia. Okay. Uh, eight, eight, eight years later, uh, the sociologist Joseph Sandy Himes, the brother of the novelist Chester Himes, uh, in a really interesting little essay called sort of Sociological Re Redefinition of the Negro Group, um, says that uh, to be a Negro is to be available for treatment as a Negro. So, so well, okay, I'm not done yet, right? Uh, <laughs> what, uh, uh, I mean, I'll draw, well, I'll draw the lesson in a moment. Um, another one um, that probably a lot of you have have seen, because I quote it a lot every time I get a chance, by a good friend, colleague, and comrade of mine, who's another political scientist who teaches at South Carolina State University named Willie Leggett, has uh, said that the only thing that hasn't changed about black politics since 1965 is how we think about it and talk about it. And that, in a way, may be the most crucial aphorism of them all, but I'm on a roll, so I'm going to do like one or two more. Uh, oh yeah, this one. <laughs> um, there is no left in America today, mm. right? I mean, we can talk about it. What, what there are, uh, are are a lot of people. Obviously, this is a room full of us who embrace left politics and and left social vision. But there's no left if what we mean by by a left is a social force that has the capacity to intervene in shaping the terms of political debate. So, if we start out from that presumption uh, about what the left is, and what what the left needs to do and be, then I'd say like the first question, and I know Americans have a tendency like always to you know want to um, um, walk before we can crawl and um, and uh, you run before we can walk, but the first task is to try to figure out how to build a left, right? Uh, so so I think you know that might sound. Uh, Pessimistic, or I don't know, or you know, undesirable, or crotchety, but <laughs> but but I think it would be helpful for us right, to take a little of, of our collective effort to sort of think about, you know, maybe not in this room, um, elsewhere, but at least to take the formulation that as a, as a social force that has any capacity to um, intervene um, effectively in political in terms of political debate, you know, like at any level. Actually, I mean, I think we saw this in the mail race, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know that there is no left, and the point, therefore, is to create one. Okay. Um, all right. So that said, um, I'm just going to say a couple other things, right? Because I've done like three of my ten to twelve minutes already. Uh, I really am trying to watch it. Um, uh, I guess I have a, um, or I would like to trouble. One of uh, one aspect, uh, a different aspect, I guess, of of the uh, description of the panel's charge, uh, which uh, has to do with the formulation about racism being transformed. Because if you stop and think about it for a second, what that sort of formulation does, and I know it's common, like we, people always use it, right? It, it, it's, but it's actually a reification, right? Uh, because it dehistoricizes. Racism, and it and and it invests, and I've you know I've I've writ, I've read enough of and written about um, um, it, enough of formulations like this among people, even a lot of people who consider themselves giving Marxist accounts or or, or <coughs> historical materialist accounts of racism, that there's a fundamental tendency to ontologize racism as a category, and by by that I mean. To treat racism as a thing that has the capacity to do shit. Right? <laughs> I mean, and and, uh, and and that's the problem. Uh, Thomas Holt, a uh, historian at the University of Chicago, uh, whom, whom I assume a lot of people know, did, did this book on the color line in the in the 21st century, whatever the thing was called. And all the way through this, right, uh, uh, he's following Stuart Hall. Which I think it's seldom a good idea, actually. But. Um, but been following <laughs> Hall to give a sort of um, 
materialistic <coughs> sounding account, but it's it's a materialistic sounding uh, because it's engaged at a level of abstraction where all where all of the concrete social mechanisms that actually undergird the reproduction of institutional relations are invisible, right? So what Holt does, for instance, is talk about how racism has transformed itself, right, from the 17th century to last week. Well, if racism is transforming it, itself, then A, racism is a thing that has some consciousness, um, and so, so uh, you know, but let's just cut out the middleman and call racism Yaku. Um, <laughs> but, but that is a common problem. So, I mean, that leads to this. And I'll stop my harangue shortly because I really am. Um, I got two minutes left. Uh, oh, Lord. Um, but, I mean, but, yeah, uh, I mean, I have a lot of other notes here, but uh, you know, maybe some other stuff will come up. But... Um, I'd like to propose a sort of counterfactual thought experiment, right? Which is, what if we take a step back from the presumption that suffuses American political debate from, you know, the center wing of the Democratic Party to, um, to whatever flavor of Trotskyist it is that you, um, you have to deal with at the moment. Um, <laughs> I don't mean, I don't mean you for other questions. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I'm not being coy about that either. Uh, but, um, and, and what, what I mean, what, what, what I'm calling for, what, what, what I'm suggesting in that call is to back away from the presumption that racism is a sui generis kind of injustice, right? Um, because so much of what passes for left debate, and I guess this is another data point in, in support of my claim that, that there is no left, is that th this is a debate, uh, or the theater of, of a left debate is on MSNBC or, or an alternate or, um, or um, academic departments, certainly not political science. Well, yeah, no, no, even political science actually it shows you just how bankrupt it ultimately is. That, um, that, so, so, so what happens is, even in cases like Ferguson, for instance, right, or I mean, other instances of police brutality or of apparent racialized inequality, um, the question quickly, or the debate quickly moves from the injustice to whether it's racist, right? And, and all the participants in, in this kabuki theater of a debate have an interest uh, in maintaining you know, discussion on, on those terms. Uh, and you know, we can talk a little bit about um, uh, what, uh, well, look, like we know what, what the rights interest is, right? Because they thrive on this. I mean, there's a, it's so stunning. I mean, like the Indiana laws now, I mean, are, could, are, are the most transparent version of the, I'm fucking up the entire economy, I'm, I, am, I am destroying every shred of social protection, that, that there is, but look, there's some gay people over there trying to get married, or you know, the nigger over there, or there's an undocumented alien over there, right? Um, um, it, 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 it's a stratagem that's as old as the hills, but on the, our side of the ledger, uh, there's also a material foundation for this. Partly, it's because it's familiar, and you know, that's how we've known to organize, and especially coming out of the history of community um, organizing and Poor people are organizing, and that came out of too. You know, the, the, the different strains of the Alinsky Act position that you go to people where they are and, and you um, develop them and you let the issues emerge, and, and as they get developed, you know, then more good stuff will happen, and, uh, is, has, has run its course. It's run, it up there. Okay, it, it's, it's run its course. Um, and, and, of course, what was a dead end, like, into NGO, uh, NGOization of, 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 of black politics, um, at a minimum, um, and the consolidation of a professional managerial stratum of, of, of race relations administrators. So everybody's got an interest in, uh, in uh, you know, I wouldn't call it a diversion, but, but, mm -hmm. but in doing what Fields said, which is, um, you're discussing 
class issues and capitalism to class contradictions through this secondhand metaphor. And I'll close by this, um, and I'll leave with this thought. Um, uh, um, and the book I've been working, uh, the book I've been trying to finish desperately now, um, has as what what turns out to be its um, animating argument is that we can see um, a pattern in moments of left insurgency in the U.S. Um, I don't talk about the populist moment at the end of the 19th century, but we can see it there too, pretty obviously. But um, when when uh, the, uh, the moment in the mid 1940s, when left penetration was at its greatest in American policymaking, when when the full employment bill, a real full employment bill, passed the Senate, uh, when uh, the FDR propounded uh, I mean, the second Bill of Rights, uh, capital mobilized and defeated the left forces, and the second best uh, alternative, because I realize now that, that, that the defeats aren't what's most important. What's, what's, what's most important is the compromised second best options that, that emerge and are consolidated after the <coughs> large defeat. The second best compromise was fundamentally culturalist. Home of populism uh, and that whole schmear, uh, also like a shift in, in, in the foundation, in the normative <coughs> foundation of the struggle for black rights, and, uh, and, and, uh, wh wh uh, which, is all, which, which had been the, in the popular front years like the um, you know, social democratic struggle, <coughs> to the terms, to, to the Beckerian terms of of, of racial liberalism, right? Uh, um, and that there's another moment like that in the mid-1960s, right? When, when the victories of the civil rights movement had been won, we're at a moment now where, as Bayard Rustin made clear, it doesn't even make sense to call it a civil rights movement anymore, and the struggles that face black Americans are class struggles, fundamentally. Uh, All right, and... Uh, and and uh, you know, black power, uh, I mean, cut to the chase. And its sequelae was the culturalist compromise for that. So the punchline to all this is culture is, culturalism is not an alternative to, to class politics. Culturalism is a class politics. It's a politics of a different class from the ones I think that the vast majority of us in this room are fighting for. I'm done. All right, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, since we're a little behind schedule, I want to, uh, to just take a minute or two to make a couple of very quick responses. Um, if there's any disagreement that you had with one of the other panelists, um, or agreements, I guess, and then uh, we'll move right to questions from the audience. Uh, so we'll start with Toby. Yeah, okay. Just a minute or two. Uh, let's see. Um, so Professor Reed uh, uh, made this hit against Belinskyite organizing, which is where it come out of. And so uh, the, this this model of going to people where they are has run its cor course, right? And uh, like Ron Emanuel said in his campaign ads, you know, I I'll own that, right? Um, so I think there is a need to, um, you know, this model of just seeing just finding out what the issues are that are sort of most on the surface and not providing any analysis or engaging in any political education, um, I think. Um, yeah, the gains you can make through that are so limited now, um, and so small scale and so localized and so short term, and they just inevitably get overwhelmed by this downward spiral of neoliberal society, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so we need to push on that, but then um, I guess my question is where where like where where can we go and how far can we um, go with that, right? So, um, uh, uh, Brandon, you mentioned having conversations with people who are worried about gang violence and like how do we push that conversation to the left? Um, I think this is an important question. What kind of conversation can we have? Um, I think um, a kind of conversation that we can have is like if you have a map of uh, poverty in Chicago and a map of gun violence in Chicago, it's like lo and behold, they match perfectly, right? Um, so that's a very easy connection uh, to make and for people to understand and um, can point towards, I think, more productive solutions to the problem of gang violence than putting a thousand more um, police officers on the, on the streets. 
Um, more radical conversations, I don't know, like, um, so I'm haunted by this question from last night, why don't we talk about abolishing wage labor? Well, if you go to, uh, you know, a uh, neighborhood on the south side and talk about abolishing wage labor, they'll say, well, that's already happened, unemployment is over, <laughs> and it's terrible, uh, we need more wage labor, right? And, like, and, and within the constraints of capitalism, obviously that's true, right? Um, so, uh, let's see, um, I guess this, this connects to um, Pre Professor Nimitz's uh, statement that it will, will take a socialist revolution to overcome, um, actually I'm not, I'm not sure if you said race or inequality, well, to overcome inequality, right, yes, right, because capitalism is based on class relations, right, so to overcome inequality as such, yes, we need a socialist revolution. To overcome the problem of race in particular, um, I don't have time to make a proper argument. I'm just going to reassert that I don't think that's necessary. Uh, I think that it is going to be pos I think, I think we do face the possibility of overcoming the problem of race within the constraints of capitalism. But in order to do that, uh, we have to overcome the neoliberal form of capitalism. Um, and one big thing, you know, I mentioned what happened to the black uh, poverty rate in America at different points in history. I think a key factor there in um, you know, fighting black poverty and the superfluidity of black labor is um, economic growth. And uh, one of the problems we face now is the lack of economic growth and actually the poor performance of the economy under neoliberalism has been um, a fundamental obstacle um, to fighting um, the exclusion of black workers, right? So part of what overcoming neoliberalism has to mean is if we're not overcoming capitalism, which I think we're not going to do, it's got to be uh, restoring economic growth. Um, and I think that affords for a lot more political possibilities um, than, in that, than the crisis that we're in right now. Right. Just, really just two, two, three things. One, I, mean, I obviously uh, agree with what um, Professor Reed said, where he actually called the question, the, the, we don't have the left. And, then, and I think when, when I mentioned earlier, um, uh, heard but not seen. I, mean, I think that's ultimately what I'm getting at, is that um, that there is this space that we're missing in. Uh, when Rahm Emanuel was forced into um, a runoff, which is not an easy lift, and that's an historic election um, by all accounts, it did extend the conversation, but as Toby said, um, which, which I do disagree with, it's not as easy making the connection to poverty and crime as one would think. I think for us it is. Um, but those same communities that recognize that poverty begets crime are the same folks that actually still want more police officers. They don't want to be stopped, you know, unfairly, but, but some will make the argument that if we just had a few more police officers, then that's how those brothers would get out the corner. And so I, I think that's what I mean by when we talk about having these conversations and not just the, the model that has run its course, that we have to have conversations where people can have some immediate connection, and then having the broader conversation about the economic conditions that make our communities as devastated as they are. Is, I'm just curious, uh, I wasn't here for the campaign, is that why I understand Chile actually called for a thousand more police or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It actually polls well, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying he's okay. right, okay. but yeah, he did call for No, I was just curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on the growth question, uh, I think there's an important lesson from the 1930s. Um, the, the welfare state redistribution came into existence in the middle of a decline. The pie was shrinking. Mm -hmm. And we've got to think about that because we're oftentimes told that you can't have redistribution without growth. <laughs> yeah, we did. We have an example from the 1930s. <laughs> and you have to explain why. <laughs> why is exactly what was taking place outside the electoral arena? What was in the streets? It was the mass mobilizations in the streets. The ruling class found the wealth to carry out the red redistribution. <laughs> So yeah, I, 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 so yeah, I don't think we should we should be careful. I think about the growth argument. Think about what are the lessons from history and so on. This is why I keep I want to push on this uh, on the question of the electoral ring. I think it's the biggest political. The reason why we haven't had a socialist revolution in the United States is there's a political obstacle, and and I call it the stranglehold of bourgeois politics, the lesser evilism. 
It's a political problem, and this is what I want to, to interrogate. Mm. Uh, I agree with what you said about running the race narrative running its course. I think it, that's the case at the international level, too. If you think about the so-called third world revolutionary process, I think the, the third world revolutionary process has, has run its course. Yeah. And that the, uh, the uh, there's no separate road, special road, separate road toward the overthrow of capitalism through some third world narrative. You know, we're, no, we, we, all this, we're converging at the international level. You know. And uh, so uh, I think those are the two main things I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say. And, uh, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear what people say about this, about the electoral, the electoral issue. Well, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, uh, I'll just make one sort of quick and, and I hope sort of straightforward point about um, approaches to organizing as we go forward, right? And, you know, this, um, I mean, I think the mayoral race is, is a clear illustration of both, you know, the limitations and the possibilities uh, for what can happen in, in a situation like that. I mean, um, I, I mean, like August, I've always said that, that, um, that, the um, electoral realm isn't the realm for building a movement. It's the realm for consolidating victories that have won that, that have been won on the plane of social movement organizing. On the other hand, you know, like the Bolsheviks weren't ready to take power either, but sometimes you find yourself uh, you know, having to play a historical hand that you don't feel that, that you're ready to play, but you've got to play it, right? But I think it's important for us, though, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and from what I understand, mainly from talking to you guys, too, uh, is that um, one of the ways that this problem, or, or constraints on the electoral piece is that the kind of uh, contacts that you have to have with people in, in an election campaign are exactly the opposite from the kind of contacts that you want to have with, with people in a movement campaign or like a union organizing campaign, right? Like you, in an election, you don't want that old lady to invite you in, right, to offer you a cup of tea and, and, uh, and, and we talk about our grandbabies, you just want to leave that damn piece of literature in her hand and I get to the next house, where in in a movement or a union organizing campaign, you want her to invite you in, and you want to spend all afternoon there finding ways that you connect with her, right? Uh, and so, so I guess that that's to say, I mean, one of the problems, uh, and you know, this isn't just an Alinsky problem, but but certainly uh, in a broader framework of of activistism. Right, right, the um, uh, you know the notion, and you know, like the new Ivy League techno fetishism, trade unionism is is uh, is an instance of this too. But right, this notion that there are te techniques that you can employ, right, that will build a base and build a movement. I mean, if we could just get two percent higher density in in uh, Wisconsin, then we could get Scott Walker out of office. Um, but the but. One of the ways that the right has outflanked us, uh, well, one of the reasons that the right has outflanked us, and yeah, we all know, you know, all the big ones, right? They got the money, they've, uh, they, 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 uh, you know, they've got the cultural apparatus, but they also had some place that they wanted to go, right? So, I mean, after Goldwater was defeated, they had a vision, and uh, um, a vision of the kind of society that, that they wanted to create, and then they went out and dug down, like gorillas, basically, in the suburbs. Um, to field test messages, right? Uh, to that, that that would function as condensation symbols that would knit a constituency together, like that. But for us, for some reason, and I think it's our our cohort, right? The new left, who who just got frightened of the idea of power, right? Because there was something dirty about it. Um, what what remains of a left? What what, what, what's what, what's melted down to to a de facto or what calls it or a nominal left, I guess, in the U.S. is like a combination of earnest young young people who are so fully in, incorporated into neoliberalism that they don't understand or they don't see that they are. So that's where you get the doing well by doing good crap and everybody starting the NGO and all that stuff. And 
And, and, I mean, the broader NGO apparatus and these sort of fantasies about the wisdom that will emerge from, from, from the people, uh, uh, I mean, w w without any political education, basically. Uh, so, I'm done. Can I just add to something? Uh, or, uh, it'll, yeah. it'll come out in the questions. Let's get some questions from the audience here, and I'm sure you can. Um, so, uh, Pam. Okay. Uh, I just, I wanted to ask about the formulation by um, Adolf Green about there's no left in America today, but then you sort of qualified that. You said, as in there isn't a social force that is um, able to intervene in many sort of significance. And just thinking about how in Platypus we also think about there is no left, but our qualification, I wonder what you'd make of this, is that, you know, in many ways that is a result of a kind of deeper problem. The fact that there isn't a social force to transform the world is actually a result of a much mm -hmm. deeper problem. And that at least one dimension of the problem is that the, the left has lost some sense of its own political imagination and sense of history. Mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, for example, last night uh, when we had an open plenary, uh, someone from the audience asked, well, you know, what about freedom? Everyone here is talking about wage equality and, you know, all these things, but is the left interested in human emancipation? And, you know, today that seems to be a narrative that the right is much more comfortable in talking about than the left itself. And so, you know, maybe we're on this issue of, you know, how to make race practical, but how to make these larger ideals, you know, uh, you mentioned, you know, what, is, what does a, a poor black man from the ghetto have to do with the American Revolution? Well, how could the left, you know, sort of reconsider, right, the narrative of human emancipation as being part of its task, as part of its legacy? Because I think that might also play a part in the absence of a left political imagination. Well, yeah. I mean, just very briefly. Um, yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think that's probably right. It sounds. Uh, it sounds right to me. But what? Where I would think that you know, you know the big ideas come into play is um, in the backs of the minds of the militants who who uh, shape and and uh, frame the the strategic directions and organizing campaigns, right? Because uh, I mean, yeah. I mean. So, 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 like the crucial thing, and you know, I mean, this is why we need militants, right? I mean, this is what cadre are all about, right? Uh, as um, transhuman, back and forth from mundane popular concerns to the larger, uh, or frames in the larger critique of the vision that comes, uh, you know, comes from a coherent left that wants to go someplace. Um, I want to, to pose a question about the uh, issue of the reification of race. Um, and I wonder, uh, you know, if, if we could say something like, instead, the way that race functions as a concept in reality, and in that sense, we would be questioning uh, to what extent race is both um, more than the sum of its parts and less than. And so the problem you seem to be posing is that it's recognized as um, more than the sum of its parts and then not less than, right? Which would be kind of another way of thinking through the, pro the problem of reification. However, like many other things that we might consider forces, um, objective forces in history, um, you know, it actually is the case that race does do shit. That, right? Like we forget that it's made, but then it also does do shit on its own, like even more than like politics can do in a, in a sense. Um, so I'm kind of, I want to ask to what extent this um, idea is maybe necessary but not quite sufficient for understanding um, the problem of racism in a, the United States today. And I wanted to pose that question kind of in relation to something that um, Brandon brought up in relation to speaking to mothers on doorsteps that I thought was quite profound, which is that the left tends to disappear. Um, so the other question kind of underlying this attempt to maybe bring up the like idea of reification as a problem for us, like and in, in maybe insufficient recognition, um, would be can politics happen through personal relationships? 
Um, you know, uh, Professor Reed, you also brought up this idea of what we would expect when we're organizing, right, which is a face-to-face -face phenomenon. Um, so if that makes sense at all, it's, it's kind of a question, but also just kind of a problem. Well, I'll start with the part that I do understand the most in that, um, is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less, I'm reluctant um, to simply um, um, boil this situation down to class. I'm reluctant to do that, to be honest with you. I get that there are classism that exists even within black, you know, but do I get stopped and frisked because I'm poor, or do I get stopped and frisked because I'm black? Or do I get stopped and frisked because I'm black driving in a poor neighborhood? I think I get stopped and frisked because I'm black, to be honest with you. Um, and I think that you can have 200 schools in Chicago without libraries because there are black kids there. Um, because there are black children in schools that do have libraries whose parents don't have, happen not to be poor. right? So I, I, I do... I think that like this 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 challenge of being able to you know connect in a like a real way uh, to to Black America, um, but one of the things I think that the Chicago Teachers Union did effectively, and I'm not saying that you know we are the standard bearer for like left, um, but some would would probably make that argument, but we offered a vision. Mm -hmm. We said, here's what all children deserve. This is what they deserve. And then we begin to organize around that vision. I think sometimes where we get a little frustrated is because we, we, we want to have these um, like large picture conversations, which I think are necessary when it comes to laying out the vision. But when we're talking about in real, like everyday terms, you have to be able to connect that vision to the people that are most impacted because that vision has not existed or has not been presented. I actually think that the electoral experience gives us an opportunity to express those ideas because right now, no one is listening right now unless there's some sort of commercial ad. I'm not saying that's the best form of, of, of organizing. I'm saying that's just what it is right now. So we took advantage of the moment um, to run some candidates who had more left-leaning principles in, in, a, in, a, a, in a stretch that, quite frankly, I, I don't want this to be lost either. Tara Stamps running the 37th Ward, or even Chewy Garcia running for mayor, that happened in part because there was a vision that was created, that there was some movement on the ground, there was a little bit of heat on the streets, but because this has been foreign, this never happened in Chicago. We should be clear about that. And because it never happened in Chicago, there wasn't a full context. So some of us were just making best of what we had, right? Keep in mind, Dr. King left Selma, came to Chicago, and said, hell no. <laughs> right? Like, this stuff is hard. This stuff is, the, one of the greatest American heroes was ran out of Chicago. By black people, by the way. Right? So there are these class dynamics, but to your point, sister, that there are these everyday conversations that have to be had, and if we're willing to have those conversations, and then stay with those conversations, and stay there, and stay there, because guess what? When we first started having conversations organizing poor people, that the mayor should not take control of your school and turn it over to a private operator, even though that school was going to get everything that they had wanted, we had to convince poor people that you've been denied, the mayor's going to give you that, but he's doing it in the wrong way. And to have those conversations, to say you're finally going to get a librarian, you're finally going to get paint, you're finally going to get a teacher, and we're saying that the privatization aspect of it hurts us long term, you have to have that conversation, and guess what? You have to have it again. And then you have to have it again. If you're going to have the type of social revolution that's necessary, without those conversations and without them being expressed, quite frankly, in an electoral cycle, when people otherwise are not paying attention because they're living in horrific conditions, we have to use everything to our advantage to build a left. And then once we build it, don't go away. Yeah, well, I, mean, I agree. And um, I would also say, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think the CTU is a standard bearer, frankly, for, 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 for an approach to trying to build a left. Quickly again, look, I think the best way to avoid um, you know, the debate about, uh, about class reductionism mm -hmm. is to stress what capitalism is and how it makes sense to think of it. Capitalism isn't just class relations or production relations, right, at the point of productions. 
capitalism is a social order. It's a social and cultural order that's solidified, consolidated, mediated, and, and I mean, reproduced through social relations and patterns of, 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 of social relations. And I've been arguing for some years now that I think it makes most sense to look at race, like gender, like feeble-mindedness in the 1920s, and many, many other categories, right? As um, it, it, it's kind of a clunky phrase, I wish, and, and I wish I had something better, but like, as, as species of a genus of, of ideologies of ascriptive differentiation and hierarchy, and by that I mean hierarchy based on what you supposedly are instead of what you do. And in, and in that sense, it's not race or class, it's not race or capitalism, Race is one of the means, uh, the, the technologies of, 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 a, of a reproduced hierarchy that all class societies have, right? Uh, you know, the divine right of kings and what, um, and what, and, and what, uh, what low-born peasants were capable of. English Victorian um, social scientists were absolutely convinced that the English working class was racially different from the aristocracy. Why? Because this is another point that I didn't make before. The heyday of race as, as a particular discourse of, of ascriptive hierarchy, right? The moment of its particular power is like the last third or so of the 19th century, first third to half of the 20th century, depending on where you are, uh, or were, right? And, and one of the reasons, and, and I've taken this as um, an alarm bell or as a signal that there's some ideology at work, that in all of these debates now about the race-class dichotomy, and just like Jim Crow, till it turns out that even Michelle Alexander says, well, it's not real. Uh, but, but the question becomes, why, when, when we reach for examples to, to show the self-subsistent power of racism, the... The, discurs the overwhelming uh, I mean, discursive tendency is to make analogy with some shit that happened at, at, at those earlier periods when it was very clear that by law, race was the way the wor world was organized, right? But, 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 but it's a much more complex circumstance now. So even <coughs> statistical, bless you, but even uh, the statistical disparities that appear to shake out by race uh, the often enough are more complicated and 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 and, and I mean stem from much more complicated sources. Like even you know the wealth gap, for instance. Turns out, after all, that once you really control for class, there's almost no racial wealth gap. Right? Uh, that um, you know black people with with the same cultural um, at advantages coming from the upper class backgrounds have the lo and behold they've got you know, about as much wealth as their white counterparts do, right? So the racial wealth gap, even, is a class wealth gap, I mean, when it comes down to it. And, and health disparities, it's the same thing, right? I mean, once you really control for class, I mean, almost all of the health disparities by race uh, disappear. And the criminal justice thing is more complicated, but even a lot of that uh, is is more complicated. Like if you're in Appalachia, for instance, or, mm -hmm. or in Alabama, you, you would be just as likely to be stopped and frisked as a white person in, in a broke community. Uh, uh, because what's the key thing that's at work there is a form of neoliberal policing that has to do with suppression of these, you know, I, mean, I don't want to call them surplus populations, and I definitely don't want to call them you know, precarious. Um, but, but that um, expanded in industrial reserve army, right, uh, that's produced, that makes growth on, ne uh, on ne neoliberal terms possible, right, that makes Starbucks possible and all the rest of that. Shit. Yeah, let's take another question. Um, you, uh, yeah. Um, Professor Vince, uh, yeah, I work with, with Brandon, and, and a lot of what he's saying you know, reminds me of some of the issues that we've had. And, you talk about the school privatizations where the school's not closed, but it's turned over to private Congress operating and having conversation over and over and over again. And I'm just thinking some of the things you were saying, to try to move those conversations would be 
infinitely more difficult. And by the time we could convince people in these communities about something like social re socialist revolution or the idea that electoral politics is, um, you know, completely not the realm in which they should have their attention, while some of these ideas, I mean, I think there's convincing arguments, I just don't believe that we could ever move them. And if we did try to move them, we wouldn't be able to move anything else. And the time it took us to do that, we couldn't move anything forward. So I guess, in, in, in your thinking, how do we fit those ideas into an actual politics that allows us to achieve anything for the people that we need to achieve it for? Let me just say, I completely agree with Brandon in using the electoral arena as an opportunity <laughs> to talk to people. All I'm saying is we shouldn't see it as an end in itself. In fact, when the election is over, you want to continue having those uh, discussions with people. You want to keep, you want to go back to, yeah, no, no. The election is just an excuse to have discussions with people. But if we say yeah. that, I mean, to your point that the only way to reconcile this is through socialist revolution. Yeah, yeah. I want, yeah, I, I want, and I, I want to keep eyes on the prize. Mm -hmm. That's what I, yeah, that's what I'm arguing for. That's our long-term goal. And if we have that as our long-term goal, then we make judgments on a day-to-day -day basis. How, do, how does that fit, help us to get to that goal? And independent working class political action is crucial. Independent of the bourgeois parties. We won't get to socialist revolution if we keep burying our heads into that black hole of bourgeois politics. So, yes, uh, that's our long term ago. I keep our eyes on that. And we figure out on a day to day basis the discussions around police brutality with people, the question of the minimum wage. We take, we take those day-to-day -day fights that people, that people are involved in and so where they are, but keep our eyes on the goal. I think just one other point note to that real quick. So something that Professor Reed said too, one of the frustrating things about the electoral season is, you're right, you're having good conversations with people and they want to keep you at the door for 20, 30 minutes and you just can't do it. But now we have at least three more, four more years until 2019. Now, there's some other immediate elections that, that are coming up, and I'm not saying we skip and sit out 2016. I'm saying that I can go back to that door where I couldn't sit for 30 minutes and have that conversation, but I think we have to be very clear about this, too. When we think about long-term projection and what we want to accomplish, we can't be afraid to actually put in a little bit of work. And I think that's what we're ultimately missing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Gregor? Yeah, uh, I would love uh, Brendan and August uh, to address my question for some reason. I just think that... It will be very interesting to hear your perspectives on this, and uh, maybe this is something that comes up in Professor Reed's work a lot, kind of the function of the professional managerial class in anti-racist politics today. Um, I would just like you like to hear your thoughts on kind of, I mean, there is always this idea that Black Lives Matter and so on, and a lot of social movements have a, a more democratic appeal than, than <coughs> black movements in the past have had because they appear more inclusive, and yet, and if I, if I take your point about the professional managerial class directly, at the same time we have a very distinct group kind of setting the terms for the debate in which we kind of are, we should be addressing questions of racism and socialism um, today. So do you think, um, what would you make of that category, PFC? And kind of how do you think, do you think it is operating? in contemporary anti-racist politics, and if not, kind of, what would your analysis be of the function of Black Lives Matter? Well, I, I think I alluded to it a, a minute ago and I said the question of police brutality. I mean, that's the fight you want to, yeah, every time, you, you want to be a part of those fights. You're looking for opportunities to have discussions with people to help them draw the big conclusions about why, is, why does police brutality exist. It's inherent in class society. Police did not always exist. It's when class inequalities emerge, that's when you have police to serve and to protect the interests of the rich. So, yeah, you want to be a part of those fights. The, the, can you just, the managerial part, just make sure I'm understanding that question. Right? Uh, I mean, the professional managerial class? Well, because I think, if, I, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, and I, I think... What our brother was getting at, as far as you have, you know, the black bourgeois, or you have this ruling sort of elite 
that wants to function primarily in electoral because it's the safest space in which they can maintain their their class interests, but it also uh, prevents like social movement from, as Professor Reed said earlier, of like when you get a moment, like w does the left exist to the extent in which you actually have to call upon them to negotiate? And so if I'm understanding that correctly, this is probably one of the more frustrating parts about this season. I'll try my best to do this in 60 seconds. When Rahm Emanuel began to negotiate, he did not negotiate with the people that even forced him in the runoff. He went right back to that ruling class. Right, to, for them to sell that, look, I know he's bad. And I know he has you know, bad intentions. But you just have to trust us as sort of the ruling managerial class within this dynamic that we're going to try to better hold him accountable to, uh, to, to the things that you're concerned about. So in, in my estimation, if I'm understanding your question correctly, absolutely exists. It exists, and I think this is where we actually have opportunity. My closing thought around this. What this election season did, it exposed what you're talking about. Because for too often, if you are poor in a community, you're black, you're oftentimes told who your leaders are. And so now, black folks, when we have conversations about moving our conversations to the left, those people that said that they negotiate on, on behalf of our frustration, I have simple questions to ask them. What legislative initiative did Rahm Emanuel commit to in order to alleviate the pain that we're experiencing? Did he talk about pensions? Did he talk about who's going to manage those pensions? 401ks, did he talk about elected representative school board? Did he talk about stop and frisk? Is he going to eliminate and remove his push for mandatory minimum? If there is no legislative agenda that came out of that negotiation with that ruling class, now those who may have been suspect a little bit of the black sort of bourgeois, now we have an opportunity we knock on a door to that same woman that we're talking about the issues on her block and say, look, those folks went in there, had a conversation, and did not come out and talk about mandatory minimums and how that actually hurts our community. No one came out of that talking about McCarthy's approach to ultimately like police our communities uh, to the extent in which causes harm. No one in that meeting who called themselves a black leader brought back anything of real substance and value about how the two-thirds of corporations in this state do not pay their fair share. Right? So I think this election season allowed us an opportunity because there was some movement. Be clear, you don't get a runoff without a few people actually on the ground creating some heat on the street. Does that make sense? A little bit? All right. Um, sorry, about this, um, I don't recall everything in your question, but I feel like one thing it made me think of was, um, uh, I forget if it was after um, Michael Brown or Eric Garner, but one of the Koch brothers um, came out with a plan to deal with, with, I think it was both police brutality and mass incarceration, right? And I mean, basically the, the perspective is that in their libertarian free market utopia, this sort of uh, racist outrages wouldn't occur, right? Um, and um, I think that, I, I was worried, about, I don't remember all the content, but I, I felt like it was, you know, very seductive, actually. And um, I think that if you don't, if you worry about these instances of racism and you don't have like a class analysis of what's going on there, then that can lead into um, these um, reforms that are totally consistent with neoliberalism, and we all know where that leads. Danny? Um, I was listening to an interview recently from 2009. It was Grace Lee Boggs was talking about Obama's election, and she said, oh, I don't have any illusion about him, but what I think will be good about him is he'll show some kind of limit to some kind of politics that's been passed down from, say, the 80s and the 60s. And in a way, I think her predictions end up being correct, but not in perhaps the way that she wanted. And to me, first, that's with Occupy, uh, where there's a sort of ambivalence with respect to Obama, where it'd be, at first, some people would say, oh, yeah, well, he's the president, he's defending the capitalist class, but then some people would be like, oh, no, there's other sort of, um, I guess, axis of domination or other things <laughs> that he can't be um, held to uh, be taking some kind of political move. And uh, recently as well, with um, sort of the Ferguson protests as well, there's been a similar thing that's happened where, uh, okay, so we have a president who's black, but there's also sort of these uh, brutalities that are happening that are um, disproportionately against uh, people of certain 
populations. And so, once again, people would go, well, okay, well, racism is then beyond, sort of, it's like outside of the system, and sort of universal. And um, I guess to me what that has sort of shown is that there's been missing some kind of historical continuity or something that's been passed down. And this is not something that I don't think can just be like, oh, well, the problem is you guys aren't considering class or inequality. Uh, that's what's missing. That this is actually something real that would have to be worked through somehow. And so I was interested if anybody would want to comment on that. That's to all the panels. But I'm not, there's a question. I, I, so it's just, I, to me, there was like a kind of ambivalence to some of the politics with respect, um, recently with Ferguson Occupy, and that it seemed to be sort of paralyzed by a kind of uh, critique from both the 60s and 40s. That's probably what I was missing. That paralyzed in the sense that, um, like, oh, well, like they wanted to use old civil rights critiques to sort of explain things, but it wasn't, it seemed to be, I don't know if outdated, just seemed to be sort of abstract. I was curious whether or not I thought you were about to say that what she said uh, uh, suggested that this would be a learning opportunity. Yeah, that's, but that would, it yeah. doesn't seem like there's been learning. I, okay, that's, I, yeah, that's, that's what, what that was yeah, my yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I was saying that yeah, okay, predictions yeah, ended up being yeah, yeah. right in sure. well, almost the wrong way. And I'd be curious to throw the question back at you. This is why I, I, I raised this question. What I see is the, the political obstacle, and I refer to it as lesser evilism. And my sense for a lot of people is, yes, we know, okay, Obama didn't do what he said he was going to do. Boy, look at the alternative. And it seems to me less evilism drives a lot of people back into it, the fear. And that's why I think we've got to take on the less evil question. Yes, we know Obama's, okay, he's, we, he didn't do what he promised. But that's what I hear. Like, um, I want to go back to this question of, or this point uh, that it would take a socialist revolution to overcome racial inequality. I think a lot of people in this room might agree with this point, and there is like the begging question of like, so why is it that Black Lives Matter happened and that does not become a moment of opportunity for the left in America to mobilize around this question, to reinforce the point, this point, or to simply further politicize the left? A lot of people who are in the streets in this moment. Um, so I would like to know your perspectives on sort of, particularly now thinking about Black Lives Matters, how is it that it really became, it seems maybe that the moment has passed, and maybe you might disagree, maybe not completely. That the particular moment that was at the height of December, I would say, is not quite there. I mean, if you disagree, that's fine. But that there, there seems to be a feeling that it's been a loss of an opportunity for the left. And I would like to know if you disagree, fine, but if not, what are your thoughts there? Mm -hmm. Frankly, I don't think it ever was there, right? I mean, and, and I think this speaks to, like, another problem that, that we have, right? Um, um, you know, there's a difference between demonstrations um, and political and a strategic political action. And one of the problems with all this stuff, Occupy, you know, and anything's got a hashtag in front of it, right? <laughs> um, is is that people, you know, not only, and this is the part that really concerns me about it, it, it it's a, not just that people have trouble recognizing the distinction between um, the pageantry of protest, as my comrade Mark Dudzik puts it, and, and a strategic political action, it's that often they don't want to acknowledge that there's a difference, right? Uh, right, right because there's a solipsism about this kind of politics, right? Um, you know, I mean, going back to Occupy, I mean, oh, oh no, no, actually, sorry. Um, I, mean, I remember seeing demos in Berkeley uh, after the, the um, Eric Garner verdict. And what struck me about them was the shots of of young people, and always Berkeley, but you know, but Berkeley gets a bad rap, <laughs> but Berkeley's not everywhere. Um, but the people lying down in the front of Amtrak trains taking selfies, right? And, you know, I don't want to be an asshole about this, but, <laughs> because, you know, I, mean, I, I, you know yeah, I did dumb shit when I was young, too, but, <laughs> um, but the problem is, all right, 
so it's a different kind of anecdote. But 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 a guy in my grad class, we, we were you know discussing you know, an article on the logic of how social movements form and uh, pursue power, you know, get consolidated, get re reformulated. And this guy says to me, well, he's got a problem with this model because if you consider hip hop as a politics, you know, form of politics, then there's no space for it in this model. So I then, you know, <laughs> calmly try to give him an account of how people came to see hip hop as an expression of politics, things that were happening inside you know, academic life, the retreat of, 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 mm -hmm. of uh, insurgent politics of, you know, outside the university, so forth and so on. So, so I get through all this, and then he says, well, but those young people who embrace this really do believe it, it's a politics. So the standard that if you believe it, <laughs> then it's true, is kind of where we are, right? And so I, mean, I said to him, you know, like years ago, when I lived in Washington, and I walked to work, uh, every day on the way to work, I'd pass a liquor store on the corner of, of 17th and Columbia in the Northwest, where, and there was a brother who stood out in front of that liquor store all day long, wearing everything he owned. And he really believed he was Marcus Garvey. But you know, the fact is, he wasn't Marcus Garvey, and of hip hop's not, not politics. But this is like. <laughs> yeah, look, look, I mean, I know this is funny, but. But the point here is, you know, isn't that, you know, uh, I mean, the young people are stupid and pampered and self absorbed, though. Um, you, you can understand, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania, so I have like, I have John is like a vice cop about this, but, <laughs> but, but actually it's a failure, or, or, or it's more testament to the fact that there is no organically rooted left politics, right? Because, I mean, like when I was 21, I was stupid, but, but, but I turned 21 in 1968, right? So uh, there were grown people around me fighting struggles, and, and back then, I guess, you know, we didn't think that, well, we're the young people in the room, shouldn't you be asking us what we think? Uh, so like we wanted to learn, right? And we knew we didn't know shit, and felt, uh, uh, I, 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 I remember when I took my first, first um, real full-time organizing job in Eastern North Carolina, what, what, what one of the first things we came up against was the people in Poor People's Organization thought it would be possible to um, get the Corps of Engineers at Fort Bragg to come and pave some streets in the black community. So, like, I was working both with them and with the black GI anti-war organization. I didn't know what to do, right? I mean, because the Marxist in me says, no, no, no. Uh, you know, you, you, you've uh, got to take the anti-imperialist position and take this as a moment of education. And, 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 and uh, convince the leadership of the poor people's organization that they shouldn't fight to get the military to pay, pave the street. Of course, the military wasn't going to do it anyway. But, <laughs> but I, mean, I also understood that I didn't live on that street, although you know, my street wasn't paved either, but I had the option to leave and go, go someplace else. So then the question becomes, well, what do you do as an organizer, right? And uh, I, mean, I understood I you know, had people, had some, you know, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but but what I did would have had the potential to have some impact on people's lives. And I was 22, and it, and and I had ideology in my head and practice in my head, and 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 it bumped up against each other. And the point is that I could call older organizers who've been out in the field, right, and talk things through with them. And you know, the answers are ultimately un, unsatisfying to me <laughs> because they always came down to some version of. Do what you think is the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> like I shouldn't even call you. <laughs> but you know that's the way it goes, though. And see, that's so. It's not just a problem of you know unfocused, um, self-absorbed young people. The fact that there are legions of unfocused, self-absorbed young people uh, is an expression of of the weakness or the absence of of an organic left. And I just add one other thing to that point, too, because I think when we come to Black Lives Matter, I mean, Professor Reed actually, I think, really nailed it, because he gave an example about a local issue, right, um, whether it's paving streets or, 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 or whatever, but the, the, the absence of, like, elders, if you will, um, in the organizing structure is, is, is difficult as an organizer right now, and I say organizer with a small O, 
because I'm aware of like what organizing looks like. Um, but I had to find and seek them out, and the conversations were very much the same, with the exception of what we did, young brother. <laughs> I'll just add that part to it. But so, but, you know, it's like, well, okay, you all, like, you woke up and Dr. King was assassinated. Like, so the context was different. And so I get why you did that, right? But we don't have that experience. But I think right. to your point, so let's look at a local issue here in Chicago. Very small, but it's a big deal when it comes to like how we look at overturning. An elected representative school board, in theory, would give $6.5 billion right. to black, brown, poor people. Right. Now, now, in theory, right, I get that there'll still be some forces in play that we would have to compete with. When we were organizing on the ground of like, just pushing a couple of candidates, it was a polarizing issue that even the folks that liked the incumbent, they voted for it. But they recognized this ERSB, elected representative school board, how do we connect Black Lives Matter? to something like that on a very local issue that ultimately has implications about how we like deal with capitalism. Because if, if like capitalism in of itself of course has its challenges. But if I don't have the fundamental right as a parent in Chicago to have some say so, some say so on whether or not my child has a librarian. If you're talking about overthrowing an entire structure, if I can't even get say so on a school board, it's going to be very difficult to have that. So I think we have to imagine on the left what Black Lives Matter actually means. ERSB, stop and frisk, um, you know, the prison industrial complex, but make it, make it fit a local issue and then begin to organize around that. So now when we go back and knock on doors in the 37th Ward, hey, guess what? We still don't got an elected representative school board. You know it's $6.5 billion there. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. We need to wrap it up. So I'm going to take two more. Huh? Brendan, I, I, the question was oh. also directed to Brendan. No, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I, that's a compliment. I, 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 I thought. Now we're going to give me an earring too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, long before Black Lives Matter, many of us were involved in police. We used to call it police brutality work. Yeah. And so uh, we tried to work with young people. Try, I alluded to this earlier, trying to help people understand why does police brutality exist. It's a class question. It's fundamental. So you use it as an avenue, as an opportunity to do to try to get to this larger, help people think about the larger picture. One of the things that uh, uh, Adolf said is very important and about the. Uh, when you, talking about the civil rights, it's not only the absence sometimes of the elders, but it's oftentimes sometimes the sins of the elders. Right. Right. The sins of the elders. And one of the reasons why the, uh, I, I'm convinced the civil rights movement came about is because the sins of the elders, what happened in the labor movement. And in other words, especially the, uh, the, when, the when the labor official took, uh, the, voted for the, uh, the, the war drive. Mm. Mm -hmm. The war drive, especially the no strike pledges and so right, right. and the absence of a working class leadership. Right. Yeah, for the for the civil rights movement. So you get this this petty bourgeois layer uh, that comes into existence. Yeah, don't forget the purges already. Oh yeah, that's oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, but yeah. that's a, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you guys get purged in that process? Too? <laughs> uh, well, my father. Yeah. 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 That was and, and look, I mean, a quick thing on that too is that. Uh, I mean, again, like th this is consistent with, with the point about it's not just the defeats that do us in; mm -hmm. it's the second best alternatives mm -hmm. that we're able mm -hmm. to salvage, right? I mean, after the defeat, because yeah. you know, I mean, you got to remember, like, for a good twenty-year period in American political life, and and I mean, the first twenty years after the end of World War II, it was impossible to use terms like inequality unless you're talking about race. Uh, or um, um, or um, economic in, injustice or or re redistribution that there was no place for them anywhere in, uh, in the respectable political debate. So people who had who who had been leftists faced a conundrum of getting behind defense spending, Cold War driven <coughs> economic growth mm -hmm. as a way to improve the conditions of of a new working people. And this is another one that sort of Came, came around and bit the left in the ass, right? Um, and I'll just punctuate that by saying that um, I can't decide what, whether it's the embryo or the zygote, but what, what eventually developed full-blown as neoliberalism 
began in in the John F. Kennedy administration. So just to be clear about that. So I mean, I don't know if anybody's got any Camelot fantasies out there, but you can bury them quickly if you do, because I think that was the beginning of the influence. You think I was All right, let's, right. let's take two questions, and then if you guys could uh, just say anything in cl closing remark uh, in your response to these two questions, uh, Jeremy and then Nick. Uh, so I, I wanted to go back to this where it started, which was Toby saying that there's a crisis of neoliberalism and not capitalism, and that politics designed to somehow reorganize neoliberalism rather than capitalism are feasible and possible in the present. And I guess, I guess I find myself like wondering where is this crisis of neoliberalism? Like if we're talking about stagnation, you know, since the '70s on and off, you know, it depends what numbers you're looking at, and there are lots of debates about this. But it doesn't seem, you know, it's bad, but it doesn't seem like it's that much worse than it's been for a while. And, or at least qualitatively, like, you know, sort of doom worse. Um, and then, I mean, it seems to me people were talking about the Chicago election, but it seems to me at least a big part of why the Chicago election was lost uh, was because Obama endorsed Rahm Emanuel. Um, and that Obama played, like, a really big part in, you know, destroying any possibility, truly with all his flaws, uh, of anything outside of the mainstream democracy. It seems like another consolidation of neoliberal Democratic Party politics. Um, and if anything, the Obama administration seems to have been, to some large degree, successful in the typical things that these administrations have done. On the one hand, consistently undermining the foundations of however problematic potential challengers, whether it was, you know, some of us in the room were in the new SDS in 2005, 2006, and that died because of Obama. Occupy arguably died in part because of Obama. Um, and then... You know, so I, I'm just curious, it seems like, if anything, neoliberal uh, Democratic Party politics has been consolidated in the present, and that, how can we talk about a crisis of neoliberalism when that, you know, it seems to be operating quite functionally and quite normally? And uh, Nick, as well, take your question. Um, I'd like to return to an issue that Toby also brought up, and that's the category of surplus labor. Because um, I think some of the comments here have sort of reified race, you know, unintentionally by not really focusing the discussion on, you know, the issue of the fact that we have so many people, surplus labor, that aren't finding work. And that, you know, the political question raised by that is that it's very popular to police the symptoms of surplus labor. It's popular not in just the black community, but the white community, too. Um, you know, it's just generally popular not to have crime on the streets and not to have people harassing you, you know, walking down to the, to the corner store or whatever. Um, so, I mean, I guess, you know, in the context of the Chicago election, I don't think, I mean, we know that Chewy's Thousand More Cops wasn't original, it was taken from Brown, but even before that, we had Jesse Jackson Jr., you know, a stalwart of the progressive caucus asking for 10,000 TSA officers to be put on the street with Mark. Kirk, the Republican, telling the people that we need to have, you know, National Guard on the street or whatever. Um, you know, and I don't mean to mitigate the concern, because, I mean, obviously I don't live in one of these high-crime communities, but if I did, I'm sure I would absolutely share the concern for personal safety. In the context of the election, um, and, and I want to bring in something from a panel on Friday, uh, Misha Patel, Grassroots Illinois Action, also sort of raised this issue of how you approach uh, popular support for additional police. What do you do in the context of you know trying to win 50 plus one percent of the vote um, in, in an electoral contest while not obscuring the issue of well you know our platform is to increase the police you know presence. It's it's to endorse the state as the solution. Um, so I guess my question to the panel is how do you deal with the the, with the political problem? Of surplus labor, um, you know, do we just try and, you know, keep running these electoral campaigns, meeting people where they're at, trying to, you know, I mean, in, in fact, we do legitimate their, you know, appeal to the state to come in and fix the problem with more police, and you know, whatever happens in the foreseeable future, it's going to be more stop and frisk, it's going to be stingrays instead of ceasefire, it's going to be, you know, more of a police state endorsing that as a solution. Um, and hopefully we can try and use these progressive type candidates that, you know, hear and endorse and take up those demands as well as these other more progressive things that she was also saying that he wanted to do the $15 now as an alternative to Ron. Or do we try and run campaigns that, 
you know, obviously wouldn't get 40% of the vote if we don't talk about, you know, these crime issues in that way, but in a different way where we talk about crime as, uh, you know, a symptom of unemployment and of surplus labor and of, you know, trying to generate universal, complete, full employment for people and only get 10% of the vote. Which is the smarter strategy? I mean, how do you feel that we should go about this and do you think, you know, what are the consequences of running these campaigns that address the issue of surplus labor in the way that, you know, people already sort of just naturally do it as opposed to, you know, coming up with some kind of political addressing of the problem? Uh, so three. Very, very briefly, yeah, just yeah, yeah. these, because we're out of time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one on the election issue. Um, you know, some of you probably heard me say this before, but, you know, I always go back to a friend of mine in college used to say about LSD. Uh, uh, once you buy the ticket, you got to take the ride. And what, once you run, run a candidacy, it doesn't matter whether it's a protest candidacy or a hack candidacy, the only objective is to get as many votes as you can get. So, so the candidacy that gets 39% of the vote is, is 3.9 times better than the candidacy that gets 10% of the vote. But that also speaks to the crisis question, too, and as well as the surplus labor question. But I also want to say something about the police issue. Uh, I might be misremembering mis mis this, but it seemed to me that Karen also talked about putting 1,000 police on the street. More. 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay. Part of it is, look, it's not just an opportunistic move, right? Uh, community policing, right, which is the exact opposite of this sort of stress Battle of Algiers stuff, or <laughs> Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome plus Battle of Algiers, <laughs> is more personnel it intensive. And one of the best ways, in practical terms, to, to combat police brutality is to have beef cops who operate within neighborhoods. That's not a panacea, but, but, but who are more likely to know the people that li live in the neighborhoods, to depend on, 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 on our networks in the neighborhoods, and, and not to imagine, and, and, and less likely to imagine themselves to be an you know, occupying army. As far as the state's concerned, yeah, I kind of dig the state, actually. Uh, so, uh, um, I'm not crazy about the bourgeois state, I can't stand it. Uh, but the surplus labor and the crisis points, I think, are linked also. Right? So there's no such thing as an objective crisis, and I think this is kind of your point, right? The crisis is a political category. Crisis exists only to the extent that people make crisis political, right? Uh, and that's, you know, since the crash, right? By 2009, the beginning of 2009, there were leftists all over the world claiming this is, you know, the end of neoliberalism or the beginning of neoliberalism, the death paroxysms of, ne of ne neoliberalism. It's on the respirator. I'm thinking, well, who the fuck is going to pull the plug, right? There's nobody <laughs> going to do it, right? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm also kind of troubled by the surplus labor thing, but which is another um, ten, uh, line that has uh, that has re recurred, uh, and uh, that this was the basis for my kind of snide observation about the precariat. Because mm. what, what we're talking about is capitalism, right? I mean, that's the fundamental principle of capital, capitalist accumulation, is um, production of an immiserated working class. Right. Uh, part 8, volume 1. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound like a holy roller, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I mean, it's right there, right? There's nothing new about this. I mean, this is what capitalism is. And one of the problems that we have in this country uh, ideologically is how many people have even unwittingly kind of swallowed the golden age illusion, right? That somehow the 30 years after World War II uh, were uh, a new order, right? A new era. And, and, and like this is the new normal. So we go after uh, I mean, the bourgeoisie for violating the social compact. Mm -hmm. That 30 years is the anomaly that needs to be explained. And, and the explanation is simple, right? It was, uh, you know, we, we had class power, right? Uh, and then when we didn't have it anymore, well, guess what happened? Right? It went back to normal. Thank you. Uh, uh, the only thing I would add to that is uh, as a part of campaigns, uh, the fight for uh, public works. Yeah, absolutely. Fight for absolutely. public works. Yeah. That's the, the, that's, that's the great solve, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be built. There's a lot of infrastructure and so on. Yeah. It has to be part of the campaign. Yeah, you know, you know, obviously I 
lean towards public sector as well uh, for obvious reasons um, because I think there's incredible opportunities there. But I also do think that, as we mentioned, here's an opportunity, particularly um, when we're talking about building stuff, where we also have opportunity uh, because we know that there's uh, issues that exist within trades that ultimately lock folks out from those opportunities. Like People are working in Chicago. It just ain't us, right? So there's certainly opportunity there. I think that the last point, too, is like, I don't know if I would necessarily attribute um, Emmanuel's uh, victory to, to President Obama. I just am not prepared to do that. Uh, if you look at every single race that the President has been most responsible for, he's lost. <laughs> 2010, 2012, 2014. Um, so the President of the United States has no influence on the government, the federal government, but he has the ability to have some impact on a local election. I just, I think there were other things that played. I think there were other things at play there. And, and I think what was at play um, was uh, the same racism that has been uh, ultimately controlling the city for 50 plus years. Remember, the city has been managed by one family. 43 of the last 50 years, the very family when Dr. King showed up and he wanted to hang out in the neighborhood and be away from the bourgeois, that this is the city that Dr. King said, I've seen it all, but I didn't see nothing until I got to Chicago. Like, that stuff is still very real, and that's what was at play. I think that ultimately is what propelled Emmanuel until another four years. All right, um, yeah, so uh, I want to talk about the stuff about the campaign and policing. So it could be that... Um, realistically, a challenger could not get away from um, the issue of improved policing because that's what will get that's something that will reliably get you votes across the city, right? Um, but um, my, I guess my uh, the critique that what I would have of uh, the way the campaign went is um, the well, our so the People's Lobby, our director David Hatch uh, wrote a thing in in these times, and basically. Um, the thrust of that is that uh, we wish the Chuy Garcia campaign had been more focused on class war, on attacking Wall Street and the relationship between uh, Chicago, the city of Chicago and CPS schools and uh, the, fi the financial industry, more focused on like getting money from you know, the ultra-rich in Wall Street and investing it in neighborhoods across the city. Right? And, um, that can also address um, issues of, of policing. But if that's the focus, then um, first of all, I think that's better politics. I also think that um, it would have done better in the election. Um, about uh, the crisis of neoliberalism, the, the, the question, the way the professor re put it, how, who's going to pull the plug? I think that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, if we don't get our act together, what it looks to me is that reactionary nationalists are going to pull the plug um, by destroying the global economy. We are also seeing, we're already seeing this underway in Russia. There are hints of it in countries, other countries all across the world, right? That is, right, if I, if you, if you ask me to bet, looking at how the current trends, how neoliberalism is going to end, my bet is that it will be destroyed by reactionary nationalists. Right? And then, this is not overcoming neoliberalism and ushering in socialism. This is a very, very bad scenario. Um, uh, so, um, like, Hillary Clinton, uh, is, has she declared yet officially? I know she's going tomorrow. to this weekend, tomorrow. Um, you know who's most excited about Hillary Clinton is Wall Street, right? And everyone knows that she's got these ties to Wall Street. Uh, one possible scenario that I see is in 2016 you have Hillary, you have Wall Street, and then on the other side you have some Tea Partier who is saying, I hate Wall Street just as much as everyone in America does vote for me and not for Hillary, and then we will have a Tea Party president, and then, you know, I talked about the disintegration of the global economy into reactionary nationalism, that could be part of that scenario, right? Um, so our, my question is how can we stop that? Not with Hillary. Yeah. All right. Um, let's give another round. Before you all run off to the next panel, I just want to mention that the last issue of the PR includes an interview with uh, Adolf Reed on the farms right over here. So grab one of those um, on your way. Oh.